Although as my brother God's people said, Amen. Amen. His strength is perfect when we can't carry on. Well, let me invite you to get your Bibles out and turn with me to the book of 2 Peter. Last week we dealt with the message, Live Looking Up. You know, you don't live very long in your Christian life, but what either you're attacked or somebody is maybe saying, well, you all believe in this return of, of Jesus Christ? Well, where is he? Where is the sign of his coming? And that's exactly what happened in the days of Peter. You know, Peter was being attacked for his faith in God, faith in Christ, his belief system. And uh, Peter made it very clear that the day of the Lord is going to come. And you know, if you're a child of God, redeemed by the shed blood of Christ, we look forward to that day, don't you? When everything is over and done with, when we get to live in that world of wonder and that world of righteousness, and all wickedness is vanished and banished away from the very presence of God, and we get to behold Him who is our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer, and get to embrace Him and be with Him for all of eternity. A late great uh, servant of God, D.L. Moody said, first thing I want to do is look at my blessed Lord for a thousand years and then I'll consider what I do from there. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 9, listen to what God's Word says. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and earth, watch this, but the heavens and earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But behold, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, through His servant Peter, was making it very clear in that day, about 60, 65 A.D., Peter was looking for the precious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now think about it for a moment. If Peter and Paul was looking for it in that day and time, how much more so in our day and time are we that much closer to the rapture of the church, taking the saints of God out of this world, and then the countdown and all great tribulation, and then the end of all things when God shall absolutely vanquish and vanish His earth, back into oblivion and bring about a new heaven and earth. And so there are a lot of people who wonder about the second coming. There are wonder people who wonder about why Christ must return. And this message is really a message of, of hope and encouragement for all of God's people because you need to be mindful. First of all, God does not lie. He does not mince His words. God is going to do precisely, exactly what He says He's going to do. You can bank on that. You can count on that. He is the sovereign of the universe. The world is doing exactly what it's doing now, and He knows what's going on. So why in the world do you and I need to understand, and why must Christ return? I want you to follow along in your outline, because I want to give you some simple realities why Christ must return. And you may want to keep this handy, because... Sometimes we get a little bit weak in our faith. People say things and, and we look at the world and the world system and we wonder, Lord, when are you going to come? Now I want to say this to you. If you're without a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you don't know what can happen in your life. Nobody knows what a day holds. The Bible makes that clear in Proverbs. You don't know if you're going to get to live out this day or not. But there is one thing you need to do. You need to make sure that you make sure that you make sure that you have placed your faith in God through Jesus Christ. But the first reason why Christ must return is very simple. The promise of God has declared it. Now think about it for a moment. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, you will find God announcing the fact that He is going to come. His Son is going to come. There is going to be the reality of Christ's first coming and then His second coming. 
As a matter of fact, you can go back to Genesis 3, 15. Listen to what it says. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, the first declaration of the coming of the Lord is found in this verse. In other words, there is going to be one that's going to come. He's going to bruise the head and bruise his heel. In other words, the Lord Jesus bruised the head of Satan. Aren't you glad about that? He bruised the head of Satan. He redeemed us who placed our faith in God through Jesus Christ. And here's what God said. My promise, listen, you can bank on it because I promised it. You remember last week I shared with you how many hundreds of promises there are about the coming of the Lord. There are so many promises regarding the first coming. And uh, better than, I think, uh, 300. But when you look at Scripture, it reveals a hundred prophecies that point to the first coming of Christ. Now think about it. If you'll look at the book of Isaiah and uh, one particular passage in Isaiah, he came exactly as he was declared. He was going to be born of the place that the Bible says. Micah chapter 5 said he was going to be born in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Isaiah said he was going to be riding on the colt of a donkey. He came riding on the colt of a donkey. Do you realize that whenever God promises something, His word is decreed, it is steadfast, it is sure. The world that you and I live in has cast such aspersion at the word of God. They'll say, well, now, you know, you can't really trust this book. Because after all, there's been a lot of error that's been found in it. Show me. And sometimes you just simply need to do that. Show where is the error? Well, now you know they're there. Do you realize some of the best scholars have gone through Scripture and they've tried to find error? And they really, really have basically declared we cannot find. Why? It's God breathed. It's God's Word. It's out of the mouth of holy God. Listen to what God says in Numbers chapter 23. God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, God has announced all throughout the pages of Holy Scripture that Christ is going to come again. He's going to come in the air first to take the church. We're going to leave in the blink of an eye, less than the blink of an eye, which according to scientists is better than one one one-hundredth of a second. In other words, the rapture can take place today. Well, you say, now there's a lot of things that have to happen before the second coming. You're exactly right. But the rapture is the taking away of the church. In other words, we could go this very moment. So the Bible says God's not a man that he should lie. In other words, folks, listen. If there is no second coming, God has lied, Jesus has lied, the Holy Spirit has lied, Paul has lied, Peter has lied, James has lied, the gospel writers have lied, and there's no second coming. But you know what? God has not lied. Jesus has not lied. The Holy Spirit has not lied. There is a second coming of Christ. And someday we're going to stand before His presence in full account of our life and our walk. That's why we need to live sober every single day. Dads, you need to live with a God consciousness. Every step you take that your little boy, little girl is behind you and you're going to give account of how you bring them up. Mom, you need to understand that as you live and walk and and treat them, that the Lord Jesus is going to come and He's going to honor you. He's not going to jump on you. He's going to honor you for being a witness and and bearing witness to them, showing them the love of God. First of all, the Bible makes it clear. God's promise declares it, demands it. Second of all, the teaching of, of Christ demands it. Think about it for a moment. If you, uh, you don't have to do that, but if you turn to Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Luke chapter 21, you will find records, passage after passage, of the coming of Christ again. As a matter of fact, you'll find Jesus declaring in his own word about his coming. Listen to what Matthew 14, 62 says. And Jesus said, I am, watch this, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In other words, the very veracity, the very word of Jesus Christ has declared that he's going to come. Jesus said, you're going to see the Son of Man come. How are you going to see him come? You're going to see him come on the clouds with great glory. He's going to come out of the clouds and we're going to be uh, taken up. The church is when the rapture takes place. That's what scripture says. But he also says in John 14, 2 and 3. Talking about the disciples and before he gives them their assignment to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel. Listen to what he says. Now, folks, this is the first reference in the Gospel of John to the rapture. I want you to listen to it very carefully. It's found in verses 2 and 3. Watch. In my Father's house 
are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen to this carefully. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, what's the next word? Receive you. I love that word. In other words, you don't have to try to take off and go meet the Lord. You know, back in the early New Testament, they misunderstood. They thought Jesus was going to come in that day and time. They sold their businesses. Some of the, uh, they went out and they lived in the mountains and they camped there until the Lord's coming. Now, don't, don't quit your job. Don't sell your house. Uh, and don't go out into the mountain uh, waiting for the Lord's return. Listen, he's got the power enough to bring you home. And listen, that's exactly what Jesus says. That I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you unto myself. Listen, if Christ does not come, Jesus has lied in this text. You know, and you and I know that Jesus doesn't lie. And that's why we live. That's why Paul, every single second of his life, he knew matter. Listen, every single second of your life matters before holy God. It matters in your everyday life. Why? Because it means making a difference wherever you go. Well, not only does God's word declare it and the teaching of Christ demand it, but look at number three. The word of the Holy Spirit demands it. And the Bible makes it very clear in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of truth. Let me give you an example of how the spirit of truth works. If you're a born-again believer, know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, have you ever gone into a service or ever gone into a place where they are supposedly teaching the Word of God and the Spirit inside of you says something is wrong? They're not teaching the Word of God. They're not preaching the Word of God. As a matter of fact, maybe you pick up a book and you start reading that book and that person's supposed to be a preacher. He's supposed to be a proclaimed servant of the Lord. You don't hear anything about the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is happening? The Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, is telling you he's not legitimate. I've had that happen in my own life from time to time. and Every once in a while, I'll turn on the TV just to get an idea of what people are watching and who people are watching. And there's this one preacher, I won't tell you what his name is, but it just happened to be that uh, he was uh, trying to take up donations for a jet plane he needed because he needed to fly all over the world uh, proclaiming the gospel. And he was wanting so many people to give $1,000. And if he could get that $1,000, he could get that, is it Gold Star or something, some type of plane, and he'd get his, that Lear jet and he could fly all over the country. And and the reality of it is, listen, the spirit of truth who lives on the inside of you as a child of God relays to you the truth so you can know the truth. That's why when you hear a preacher of the word of God, a teacher of the word of God, doesn't matter where you go, you say, that's the word of God. I know I'm hearing the word of God. The Holy Spirit bears truth. Your spirit knows that Jesus Christ is coming again as a child of God. Amen? Amen. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth living on the inside of you. And he is telling you, he is encouraging you to be faithful to the finish. Sometimes it's a little hard to be faithful. I don't mean hard in the sense that you want to quit. But you just, you know, the world you and I live in. And that's why the Holy Spirit says keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on because you are going to cross the finish line someday. But the word of the Holy Spirit demands it. You know, when you stop and think about it, you know, the Holy Spirit, He's the Spirit of truth. Listen to what the Bible says in Philippians 3.20. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, look what it says, we look for. Do you realize better than 2,000 years ago, Paul is saying, I'm looking. I'm looking for Him. And so he said, we're looking for our blessed hope, our blessed Savior. By the way, let me say this. Let me give you another. Do you realize God never told his church to brace for the great tribulation? Some people come to me and they say, I'm absolutely scared to death. We're going to go through the great tribulation. Well, I'm sorry, we're not. You say, well, how do you know that we're not going to go through the great tribulation? Simply put, don't you think that God loves the church enough that he would have told the church, get ready, get braced for the great tribulation? Don't you think he would have put that somewhere in the word of God? Because he loves us. He don't say look for the great tribulation. He says you're to look for your blessed hope. We're to look for Jesus. We're to look for that day when we're raptured. You know it could be. You're getting ready to come into church. Getting ready to sit down to a Sunday morning Bible study. Or Sunday 
night uh, worship service, Wednesday night. Or you, you're just getting ready. I know some people would love this. You're just getting ready to get up and go to work on Monday morning and the rapture takes place. You can say, hallelujah, bring it on. Someone said that uh, the people who love Monday most, there's one type of people who love Monday most. They're retired. But Philippians 3.20. Well, listen to 1 Peter 1.13. Wherefore, gird up your loins. In other words, be serious, be sober. Why? And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought into the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation, the revealing, the, the unfolding. And that's what Paul is saying and Peter is saying. Listen, that's why you need to be faithful to the finish. No matter come what may in your life, don't fold up. I've seen many who are my colleagues and my peers who are no longer in ministry. Someone did a study and said of those that are in their 20s, only 10% when they get to be my age will be in ministry. Why? Because it's somewhere along the way we get sidetracked. And that's why Paul and Peter are encouraging the saints of God. That's why you need to be reminded that the Lord is going to come. Live looking up. Live being reminded. Yes, God's promised it. Jesus taught it. The Holy Spirit has declared it. And number four, the plan of the church demands it. You know, God through Paul uses the term wedding to speak of the church and the bride. Do you remember that day you got married? Now, it's quite fitting that my older, oldest sister be here this morning. I remember my wedding day. She happened to be in it. And as Charlotte was walking down the aisle, of course, naturally, I was a little teary-eyed. And uh, I think my oldest sister said something like this. She better hurry and come on. You're going to cry. Cry your eyes out or something like that. Why? Because I love my bride. I love my wife. I love hanging around her. She's a lot of fun. Now think about it for a moment. You say, well, what about us? We've got a lot of scratches and bumps and bruises and all that stuff on us. Yeah, but Christ loves us. He loves you with all of his heart and all of his soul. That's why he redeemed you. And in the Jewish culture, you know, the, the the husband would be gone away. And then he would come back and he would call for his bride, for his wife. And then he'd take her home so they could make a, so they could make a life together and a home together. Do you know that's what the Lord is going to do? Have you ever wondered, Lord, what do you look like? Now, we're human. The Lord went back up into a real body. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, This same Jesus whom you've seen taken back up into glory shall so come back in like manner. But you know, he's going to come and he's going to get his church. And he's going to take us home. That's exactly what he's going to do. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's who we are as the church. That's why you should be serious in your walk. Listen, we live in a culture where anything and everything goes. And, and they say, well, if the church is going to be relevant, it's got, to, it's got to get with the program. You know the only thing we need to do? We need to be obedient to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so we can be pure and chaste and holy before Him when He comes and calls us home and calls us into account. Husbands, how would you like to find your wife found out that you was two-timing her? Or vice versa. Wives, that your husband find out that you was two-timing him. I've talked to couples through the years who've sat across the desk from me and they've said the horrible reality that I, my husband's having an affair on me. And in some way I try to help them pick up the broken pieces. But the reality about it is when you and I entertain and walk with the world, We're committing spiritual adultery before our Lord. We're to walk pure and chaste and holy before Him. He loves us with all of His holy being. And that's why He he wants us to be chaste. You know, when you get married, there's nothing like that intimacy. Because it's God ordaining, God planned. And so Paul says that you may be a chaste virgin of Christ. You know, we love 
our, our brides, we love, you know, our family. We love our having children by our spouses. And stop and think about it for a moment. The God who designed family has lived in family for all of eternity. He loves his church. He loves the bride of Christ. And so the plan of the church, think about it. We're not quite happy on this earth. Do you ever find yourself saying, I, I'm not happy? I don't mean happy in the sense that you're not contented. I talk to people, they're getting ready to die, and here's what they say I want to go home. I want to go home. My blessed mother. All of us were around her bed before she walked out into eternity. And she made it very clear. She said, I've talked about my Jesus. I've taught about my Jesus. I've sung about my Jesus. And now she says, I want to see my Jesus. Folks, the reality about it is there is something on the inside of us as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an anxious anticipation. Why? We're waiting. We're waiting for our blessed Redeemer. That's why you need to understand. That's another reason why He's going to come. But another reason He's going to come is the corruption of the world. Think about it for a moment. You walk out these doors and, well, even our human nature knows that we're falling. Your basketball team is not winning and what do you do? Well, we won't go there right now. Your football team's not doing good. Listen. But we live in a corrupt world. Now, we're also fallen. We're fallen, but we're redeemed. But you listen, when you, when you see people that do such hideous acts as, as chain their 12 or 13 children, and, and they do such abominable things, and you look at the world, you say, Lord, when's it going to come to an end? You realize the corruption of this world demands that a holy God deal with it. Our God is sovereign and there is not one sin. There's not one act of wickedness. There is not one thing that our Father has overlooked. And He said, I've given all judgment unto my Son. And someday it's going to be dealt with. Jesus makes it very clear. You know, when you look at Matthew 16, 27, listen to it. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father. And his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his work. What does that mean? It means that the righteous are going to be rewarded. Not based on salvation. That's a gift. But you're going to be rewarded based on what you've done in your walk with God. The unbeliever, uh, they're going to be rewarded for their wickedness. So what do you mean rewarded? Their degree of doom, damnation, and eternal torment is going to be based on what they've done. Jesus will see to that. Listen very carefully to Revelation 19, 12 through 6. This is a reference to the Lord. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had written that no, a name that no man but he himself... He was clothed with vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven followed him. Upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Watch this. That with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The reality is... The corruption of this world, people think they've gotten by. And sometimes we, we may even be misled to believe, well, well, why are the wicked getting by? Sometimes we even think that, you know, the wicked are getting by. Man, they can do whatever they want. And they can, they can live in abundance. And they can have excess. And they can have houses and land and property. And they can have all of this stuff. But then you stop and realize one sober thought after that. They die and stand before the judge of the universe. They die in their sins. One of the former queens of England, not the queen mother, but one prior to her, she said, all for a moment in time. Getting ready to die on her throne. She said, all. What she was saying is, I give all my kingdom. 
for another moment in time. Think about it. There's a moment that the wicked are getting ready to leave this world and they're going to die. Now listen carefully. It's not God's will that any man perish. But the reality of it is there's a lot of people that have no desire for Jesus. They want wickedness. They want to live for the devil, walk for the devil, serve the devil. And in the reality, they're going to stand before the judge of the universe. Folks, that simply is the way that it is. All of their belief system, don't matter if they're evolutionists and believe evolution, believe we came from amoebas or came from a, a spark 12.5 billion years ago, a grain of sand that erupted. God makes it very clear. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Think about it for a moment. If God doesn't judge the wicked, then that means he's sort of applauding the acts of the wicked, right? And there is no applauding of any acts of the wicked by holy God. You know, and then the destruction of Satan demands it. Oh man, if there's one person ever one of us ought to hate with a hatred that is beyond any, it's Satan. He's behind every lie. He's behind every broken home. He's behind every adulterous act. He's behind everybody that, that drinks and destroys their body and destroys their life, destroys their home. He's the one behind all of it. He's the one that says, eat, drink, and be merry. But Satan don't give the rest of the Bible verse. You know what Satan says? Eat, drink, and be merry. Do you know the rest of that Bible verse? For tomorrow you what? Die. Voltaire was a great infidel many, many years ago. And he said, I've been a tool of the devil. He despised God, didn't want to have anything to do. But he realized in his dying hours that he had been a great tool in the hands of the devil. Listen, the Bible makes it very clear. Listen to Revelation 20, 1 and 2. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now that's a reference to the millennial reign of Christ, but the reality of it is, aren't you going to glad, think about this for a moment. Now this is hard for us to conceptualize, but you realize in your redeemed body that God's going to give you someday, the brand new glorified body that you're going to have, and by the way, you're going to have a body. I'm probably going to be my, my height that I am now, about 6'5". <laughs> but you're going to have a body. God's going to give you a body. You're going to have a body to glorify God. But you're never going to have a sinful thought for the rest of eternity. Isn't that wonderful? You're not going to get angry at anybody in eternity. You're not going to get mad at anybody. Can you imagine the devil's never going to have another heyday with you once you leave? Listen, I'm sure that's why God don't give us more of a glimpse of glory because a lot more people will say, I want to get out of this place. But the Bible makes it very clear. Satan, listen, the reality that God has to defeat, destroy, and that's why he's going to come. You know why we preach the gospel? Because Satan is doing everything he can to get souls to snatch them into hell. Reject the gospel. Have a good time. I'll give you money. I'll give you land. I'll give you property. But I'll get your soul in the end. You've heard me tell this story, but it's worth repeating it. That movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I don't know if you've ever watched it. For some reason, I just like that one. But there's a black man in that, in that movie. And he's a gifted banjo player. And they asked him how he got to be such a gifted banjo player. He said, well, I sold my soul to the devil. But the next statement after that is what intrigued me. He said, I sold it because I wasn't using it. Folks, the reality about it is you are an eternal soul and the devil wants as many as he can get because he wants a kingdom of wickedness and he wants a king. And today, better than 100,000 people have died and most of those have died without Christ. But God said he's going to lay hold of that dragon. Man, I'll be glad when we don't ever have another negative for the rest of eternity. That's what really the Bible says. There's not going to be any more sorrow, any more death. All those things are going to be passed away. Why? Because God has ordered it to be so. You know, he makes it very clear. In Revelation, 
as you look at those last words, that old serpent. Someday you'll never have another, another battle with the devil. Do you ever have a battle with the devil? I heard of a great theologian some years ago, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. This one lived back in the 1500s. But he had such a, such a battle with the devil that he got an inkwell and he threw it at what he thought the devil was. Have you ever had those thoughts? Devilish and demonic. They're straight out of hell. You didn't want them. You get out of here. And that's exactly God is going to take care of the devil. He's going to take care of the demons. And we're going to be emancipated. We're going to be freed. And then lastly, the hope of the saints demands it. You know, God through his word tells us to, to look for that blessed hope. You know, whenever you look in 1, Timothy, or 1 John, listen to what it says. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But listen. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now listen carefully. Can you imagine, conceptualize in your mind, that day and that moment and that time when you get to stand this close to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? That's exactly what John is saying. We'll see him. John, what do you mean? Are you meaning figurative? We'll see him. Now, you say, well, will we study the Bible in heaven? Well, I can't answer that, but I can tell you this. My wife wrote me a lot of letters when I was at Southwestern Seminary. And I would read those letters over and over and over and over again. Sometimes I'd get two and three in one day. But since I've had the real thing, I've not even looked at them. They're still nice letters. Might need to take one or two out and look at it. But you see, the reality about it is, John said, we'll be like him. We'll be like him. We'll behold him face to face. You and I sing that song, and we shall behold him. I tell you what, that gives me goosebumps just to think. Someday I get to see him. I'm not worthy to see him. I've not done anything in and of myself worthy of eternity with God. But I remember it at a church in Middlesbrough, bowed before my Savior and invited his son into my life. And I live looking for his coming. I listen to things that sort of give indicators of the rapture of the church. I sort of watch for different signs. You say, well, can you know what day and hour? No, you can't. But think about it. If Peter and Paul looked 2,000 years ago, how much closer is it even at the door? Friend, if you're here without a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you that all your money, all your stuff, all that you have, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. But if that keeps you from placing your faith in God through Jesus Christ, you're in a tremendous mess. You have no hope. You have nothing to look forward to after this life is over if you reject God. Your money won't mean anything to you then. The greatest movie stars, the greatest TV stars in the world that lived and that made an impact and were household names, they're dead. They're in eternity. What have you done with Jesus? Are you living expecting His coming? Heavenly Father,